So we're working on the front suspension today. The rear suspension is done. And if you remember from the previous video, we have a Porsche style Y arm in the rear with this really cool cantilever pushrod suspension setup where the pivot axis of these cantilever pushrod arms is also the sway bar. So let's see if we can get some of this stuff to move. So as the rear suspension pivots, the torsion bar imparts a torque on the other one as well. So it keeps the vehicle flat. And uh, this is a mid-travel setup. I think there was 17 inches of travel in the rear. And in the front, I limited it to 12 inches of travel. And uh, the way that I did that is I put a limit mate on this wheel so that the distance from the center of this wheel to this bottom plane can have a minimum distance of zero and a maximum distance of 12. And uh, I'll show you what this looks like as it's cycling. So if I push this lower arm up, maxes out at full compression, and then there it is at full droop. So yeah, this is a suspension system that I've had in my head for a long time. I wanted to do dual push rod and we'll go through the design process of all these components and setting the mates and stuff, but just wanted to explain sort of how this works. So each side of the suspension is riding on double wishbones and we have these little push rod arms here connected from the bottom A arm to these shocks. And so you can sort of see as it articulates up and down, the force from the lower A arm gets pushed through that push rod arm and into this pivot arm. And then that goes into the shock. And I'm using these King bypass shocks here. These are actually technically bump stops, but they have a little bypass tube on them. And it was a really great model that I had pre-existing from the other off-road designs. And it was the right length because the reduction here for 12 inches of wheel travel, the push rods are mounted in the middle of this arm. So it only has six inches of stroke. And so I have these little bypass shocks on both sides with another torsion bar in the middle. And because this torsion bar is really short, I don't expect it to deflect that much in angle, meaning that the front is going to stay really flat. And then the other consideration was these are just shocks, but they're not springs. So I needed a spring as well. And that's what you see here in the middle. This is in this configuration, the center spring is called a heave spring. And if you connect that spring to the torsion bar, this has all of the load bearing for the weight of the vehicle. And then these shocks just take care of the dampening. And so the way that I did that was this push rod arm has a concentric mate to the torsion bar. And that rotation is locked with some little splines in here. So I'll make some things transparent so you can see. So you can see the splines here on the torsion bar. Those interface with this pivot arm to lock it in rotation. And then on this one, since I couldn't get splines in the center of this torsion bar, the heave spring arm is just pinned through. So these are some little half inch pins that go through the torsion bar and then as this pivot arm moves up and down, its rotation is locked to the heave spring arm and it imparts a force on the spring to support the weight. And so that's how that works. I think this is a really cool setup. It's a really nice compact way to do push rod suspension. And it's a way to combine components where the pivot axis is the torsion bar and the torsion bar imparts the load on the heave spring. And then just a regular steering rack here. I found this really cool model on GrabCAD for the steering rack and it works really nice. And I just had to make an adapter plate to lower the pivot points for the steering tie rods. So let's jump into the time lapse. All right, so the first thing I need to do on this front suspension is drop in all the mounting points. So on the lower control arm, I'm using those polyurethane bushings with bearing bronze sleeves for load bearing. Since the lower control arm is only pivoting along one axis, and I need to map out the dimensions between the upper control arm and the pivot point on the center of the chassis. And I just need to make some holes for all the hardware and figure out where the shocks are going to mount, which I'm mounting the shocks right in the center. And so I'm starting by just making a, a flat plate extruded outward, and then I'm going to cut around that. that. That's the best way to make a simple geometry like this. This is a sort of a wishbone style A-arm and just laying it out from the top really helps me get my head around where all the dimensions are going to live and what all the mounting locations look like. And this first boss here is for the spherical bearing and the bolts that are going to hold the shocks. Then I can drop that component in and start mating it in place. Usually what I like to do is I'll make a part file for the A-arm and then I'll make a sub-assembly for that same component and attach all the hardware to that sub-assembly. 
It makes file management a lot simpler and it cleans up the component tree in the upper assembly. And so that front pivot point is going to be mounted on a spherical bearing and retained with a C-clip. And it's a pretty simple shape so far. So I just want to get all the component dimensions in there before I start doing any machining design to make sure that it's right. And yeah, I just had to make an adjustment there. So now I can start thinking about what the front suspension geometry is going to look like. And like usual, I lay this out in sketch form before I start designing any components. It saves a ton of time and I need to figure out what kind of wheel travel I'm going to get. So I'll mock up all the components as sketch lines and then check my geometry before I start designing the components. So all those lines represent the upper and lower control arm, the wheel, the spindle, and then that secondary set of lines represents the wheel as it's traveling up and down. So I can get a sense for droop and compression angle. And I ended up with 12 inches of travel on the front of this design, since this is a mid-travel sort of rally style car. And on this design, I decided to build in some caster angle into the spindle upright. That's something that was missing from my previous off-road designs. But since this car is designed to be going really fast on street and gravel conditions, I wanted to make sure that camber was correct. So I just copied the camber angle from a Porsche. And just by adjusting that spindle, I was able to get five degrees of camber. So now I can start dropping in the components for the upper control arm. And this is also going to be a wishbone with rod ends on the inboard side and spherical bearings on the outboard side. And this is going to be another pretty simple shape. And I'm drawing in what the mounting locations for those rod ends are going to be so that I can have plenty of adjustment on the threaded part of the rod end. And I also need to make sure I have enough steering angle. So that's what those rotated rectangles represent is the spherical bearing pivoted side to side for 25 degrees of steering angle in both directions. So then I can draw that front part of the upper control arm that's going to grab the spherical bearing and make sure there's clearance for the steering angle and then start drawing the shape of the wishbone from the top. And then I can extrude the shape upwards to get the A-arm. Then I can drop all the hardware into this subassembly and drop it into the upper assembly and see how it looks in the context of the rest of the vehicle. And adding my point-to-point -point mates there so I have lots of movement as, this, as the suspension travels and cycles. So the next thing I want to think about is the dimensions for the front push rod suspension. And so I'm sketching this in on a 2D sketch, but I ended up making a ton of adjustments from that 2D sketch, primarily because I needed clearance for the steering and I needed clearance for the rest of the upper and lower control arm hardware. But that line moving up and down represents the push rod. And I still have to figure out how I'm going to mount it and how it's going to pivot. So I'm starting by creating a shape at an angle in this new component, which is the push rod pivot arm. And really the only constraints here is that it has to capture the shock hardware and it has to interface with a torsion bar. And the rest of this shape is pretty simple. It's just an L shape. It's just an angled bracket. And so this is the first time I've designed a part where the main boss was at an angle. But the reason I did that was so that the mating planes in the car would line up with the rest of the vehicle and not have to be offset. And I also knew there was going to be some opportunities with this part to make some really cool looking pocket cutouts with draft angles using ball end mill machining operations. So that's what these cutouts are right here. Then I just need to add some radiuses on the inside sharp corners. And this part's ready to be dropped into the upper assembly. So now I'm realizing that I designed this part upside down and backwards. But luckily for me, I was just able to flip it and it ended up fitting on the correct side of the vehicle. Then I just need to adjust the push rod mounting location to the opposite side and adjust some dimensions on the upper and lower control arm to accommodate that change. So now I'm mating that pivot arm in place in the upper assembly and figuring out the dimensions for the push rod linkage itself. And the way to do that is just select the two components and measure the distance between their origins. And then that sets the distance for the push rod linkages. Then I can mate that push rod in place and test the cycling. But before I do that, I need to set a limit mate so that it doesn't overextend and the front suspension travel is set. And it looks like it's cycling really well. So now I need to think about what kind of shocks I'm going to use on this. And I decided to use those King piggyback shocks because I had a pre-existing model for it and they were the perfect length for this. So just mating all of the spherical bearings in place in the upper assembly and making sure that this shock cycles without binding or over compressing or bottoming out. And it looks great. And then just adding some lightweighting cuts here 
And these light weighting cuts on the lower control arm are going to stylize the part and reduce unnecessary thickness. And the shape is actually more rigid than if, it, if those pocket cutouts were not there because it sort of takes an I-beam shape along the direction of strength that you need it. And same thing for the upper control arm. Some nice stylized light weighting cuts here to make it more rigid and lighter weight. So now I need to figure out the steering. And what I decided to do was use a model that I found on GrabCAD for a steering rack that looked like it was roughly the right size and something that I could find an approximate equivalent off the shelf in real life. And so what I'm doing is just dropping in some spherical bearings in here to set the mounting locations for the steering tie rods and then building a boss feature around that. And it's just a bracket that's going to reach down from the moving part of the steering rack and grab those spherical bearings. And it should be plenty constrained. So that's what you see here is this part that grabs those mounting points for the steering tie rods and attaches the rack to the spindle upright. Then I just need to drop in the new steering tie rod and the steering is ready. And just checking all the cycling and clearance on here and it looks good. So now that I'm confident with the steering location, I just need to finalize the design for the spindle upright and put some pocket cutouts. And these are not purely aesthetic. Adding those pocket cutouts makes the part more rigid as well as making it more lightweight. And then adding all those chamfers and radius gets rid of any stress concentrations that you might have in the part because anytime you have a sharp edge in a part all the stress stays concentrated in that sharp corner so you want to reduce those as much as possible by using fillets and chamfers and it also is the only way to make the part actually machinable especially when it's got weird crazy angles like this it's not very exciting because i'm just mirroring components in but there is one useful SOLIDWORKS trick, which is that if you have a part that you need to duplicate in mirror, there's a function for that. You just select the part and a plane, and then you use the function mirror part, and it will create an equal and opposite version of that part that's linked in dimension. So any changes that you make to the parent part will carry over to the mirrored part. And so that's what I do on left and right components and suspension assemblies. So the next thing that I need is a heave spring. So since that center torsion bar is the pivot axis of the push rods, it is the load bearing component. But right now I only have shocks attached to it, which will take care of damping, but I do need a spring in there. So what I need to do is create a little arm that's going to attach to the center of the sway bar and connect to a spring that's going to support the weight of the front of the vehicle. And that's called a heave spring. And this is super common on like Formula One and other road racing applications, but I've never seen it done like this. I've never seen it done where the torsion bar connects all three components together. Usually it's a much more complicated set of linkages, but I wanted to see if it was possible to do it in this architecture, and it was. It's just, it was really tough to get all the packaging in there because it's really tight. There's not a lot of space, but I was able to just pin that center heave arm to the torsion bar. And because that torsion bar is so short, it's going to be really, really stiff. It's not going to move as much as like a trophy truck torsion bar. So that heave spring will be able to support the entire weight of the vehicle without anything wiggling around or getting too loose. But here's an example of that packaging being a challenge because I had to flip the steering rack upside down. So I needed to adjust some dimensions on that bracket component and basically just rebuild it. But it was the only way to get that steering rack to fit where it needs to be and have room for the heave spring. Now that I think about it, Koenigsegg has done something similar to this, but they put the heave spring transversely, like along the axis of the torsion bar, which was kind of an interesting design. So the spring doesn't move in and out axially, it rotates axially, and that's your spring force. But I guess this is, this just uses a traditional regular spring. But the issue that I had was sticking that spring out in the front it was just crashing into everything it was crashing into the steering rack it was crashing into its own support arm and i just couldn't get it to fit so i ended up just flipping it upside down and in order to do that i needed to adjust the shape of that heave spring arm to have more of an l shape like the other pivot arms to make sure it has lots of clearance where it needs it and so that's what you're seeing here just adjusting that shape so it's sort of like a claw that reaches out and around to grab that bottom mount. So in order to flip that heave spring upside down, I needed to move the damping shocks outboard a little bit. 
And it was a pretty simple operation. I just adjusted their mates and then adjusted the length of the linkage and it worked just fine. And now that shot can be mounted rearward instead of forward. And there's just a ton more clearance back there. And then this is pointed down because at full compression, you want that shock to be as close to perpendicular as possible to the pivot axis of the arm. And so that's why that shock is mounted downward a little bit. And now the front suspension is done.